everybody, this is Dr. Nimrod. You don't, you want to just, is, is what you say, tighten your seatbelt. We're about to take you on a ride, um, you know, from agriculture to agro industry, um, Dr. Nimrod. And give me a moment to pull up his bio. I have it here on the platform. Please go onto the platform as well for the full bio. But Dr. Nimrod is the founder and CEO of Biofield and Green Valley. He obtained his PhD from the Hebrew University in Israel, where he studied agriculture and specialized in ecological entomology. That's a mouthful. <laughs> he grew up as a fruit grower uh, farmer in kibbutz in Israel. Did I say that? Can you teach me how do you say kibbutz? Kibbutz, exactly. You said kibbutz. it right. Okay. There he realized a need to create a new approach to agriculture neither conventional nor organic, but rather based on the solid foundation of values of business viability, social responsibility, greater awareness of health and environmental sustainability. After 13 years in the academy, um, in 20, um, 2004, Dr. Israeli founded Biofield, a company with the mission to provide 21st century crop protection technology and solutions to propel his vision of spray-free agriculture. So I encourage you, please go to the Nazareth.trade platform to read his full bio. But without more, much ado, um, Dr. Nimrod, you have the floor. Thank you very much. And um, I'm going to share some, some thoughts and I'm only an entrepreneur. So if it is uh, provocative and if you don't like it, it's okay, you can throw. Now it's going to be harder, but uh, um, throw your dots at me and uh, it's okay if you do not understand or agree and uh, it sounds stupid. Um, I will say, I will start by saying that Africa can be and should be the food barn of the world. Instead, today it is importing most of its or much of its produce and, uh, and food. And this is while over 50% of the production uh, of the people are dealing with agriculture and livelihood depends heavily on agriculture. So when you say Africa, you say agriculture. And this is the problem because agriculture is a revolution of 12,000 years ago while the industrial revolution happened 200 years ago. And uh, advanced economies are deep into agro-industry. And this is what Africa needs to do, to move from agriculture, which is meant from the very beginning for survival, to supply the family be, be, instead of hunters, gatherers, it came the agriculture. So now it's time to move. And the question is how and what are the problems? And yes, I know there are endless number of problems. So I'm going to try in this one to focus on three key success factors. And um, I will start with the first one that most of the people in Africa um, are farmers and 36% are poverty, which means um, their income is less than $1.9 a day, which is ridiculous. And just imagine how many below three, uh, $3 a day or four, and who can survive with three or four? So this is a huge problem. And uh, the way to solve it is not through charity or loans, no, it is through real business to put money through real business, sustainable in the pocket of the farmer. And here, speak from Ghana, after uh, we doubled his income in one year, he says, yeah, make a lot of money. And uh, this is what he wants, and this is what they want. And this is sustainable. This is moving from agriculture to agro industry. Now, this is one story, the story of Africa. And the second story that I want to share with you is where I was born in Israel, in a kibbutz, 
which is a community based on agriculture. Less now, when I was born, it was 100% based on agriculture. And uh, I was born only 17 years after my kibbutz was founded, only 17 years. Meaning with less than, within less than 20 years, it moved from what you can see here, a rocky hill with nothing, no trees, no fields, um, no money, no electricity, no water, to a uh, prosperous agriculture, prosperous community based on agriculture. By the way, on the left side, it is my mother. And one other thing that is very surprising is when we think of the same people just a few years earlier, many of them in my kibbutz were Holocaust survivors. They were in concentration camps. My mother uh, escaped across Europe from Hungary. She lost her family, her parents. She was raised in a village. So there was no more farm, no house. And she somehow managed to get to Israel with no money in her pocket and without knowing the language, no family and no friends. So this is the starting point. And therefore, when I see Africa, I say everything is possible. Everything is possible. When I, th I think why it is sometimes looking so hard, I see differences. And when we speak on Africa, we speak in the attitude and the terminology of fighting hunger and poverty. Both are very bad. And let's say that we don't have poverty because everybody is having $2 a day. Is that good? On the other hand, in my kibbutz and very common in Israel, from the very beginning, it was always looking for prosperity. It was making people's dream come true. And I want to share with you one dream, which is my dream. And this is why I'm here today. And this is why we can and should help farmers, people, whoever they are to fulfill. And you are also very welcome to join uh, my dream. So it was, I was a farmer, you can see in the same kibbutz, very successful. And some of my orchards were organic, some were conventional. And at a certain point I was thinking, wait, both of them I spray some conventional, some organic, but what if we don't spray? We don't spray. And what, because of this, we can have, um, uh, we can sell the produce for a higher price. Wouldn't it be nice? And it all started from the point of view of a farmer uh, thinking how to sell his produce. The problem was that there was no way of not spraying the produce. And so started a long journey that took me through many years in academy and then developing my, myself with my team uh, in biofeed, uh, the technology which is uh, a breaking through and then other things that I will share here with you. And everything come, came as a result of understanding problems. So this is very recent survey saying, look, 67% of the people want without sprays. When I started my journey, no one was talking about this. We are talking about 94 and 81% are ready to pay more. Some of them even double. So the first is prosperity. Let's put it as a goal not eliminating the darkness, let's make light. And we do it by aiming to enable any farmer to fulfill his dream. And the way to do it is by creating prosperity because we do not know what their dreams are. They don't know. First, we make business. Now, the second thing is about science, agro-science. And we ask ourselves, how come that the US and Europe has very, very good technology and know-how? 
while in Africa, even Asia, India, it's not so. And uh, the answer is very simple. Just like now we are talking about Africa, we care about Africa, so they are. Those companies, first of all, care about their own people and their closest market is next to them. The problem is that the crops in Africa are different. The pests are different. The climate is different. And therefore, the technology and the know-how should be different, but we don't have it yet. You will see later that maybe we do. This is a problem. In Europe and America, fruit flies are not a problem. So it is in Israel. But in Africa, between 50 to 80% of the produce of fruits, mangoes, which is the number one fruit crop across Africa, is infested by, by fruit flies that has no solution. No solution. The same is Asia. And furthermore, not only that, those miserable farmers are losing so much fruit, uh, you can see on the left side, the female laying eggs, and you cannot see it. When you look at the fruit, you cannot see it. And so if you want to export the fruit, just a, a week or two after, you see the lava, and, uh, and that is a um, biosecurity issue because it, uh, it is a quarantine pest. Nobody wants it. And so most of Africa is under export ban. They cannot export to the best man markets in the world. But even inside Africa, it's very difficult. They have to harvest the mangoes and other fruits as well very early. And when I say mangoes or fruit flies, it is a symbol. It is a model for everything else and it is the number one fruit crop. That affect the income of the farmers. On the left side, we see the profit of the African farmer that often is negative. And this is why they live in poverty. They grow mangoes and they lose. They grow and they lose. While the Israeli farmer that is growing the same mangoes is making a very nice income. Do you see the business opportunity here for investors, for farmers, for nations? This is a multi-billion opportunity. This is exactly how we can move Africa for, from importing to exporting. And Africa, which is just next to Europe, hardly export any mangoes to Europe although Europeans do want it, while Latin America is exporting most of it. So this is the gap that we can and we should, and no one will invest as long as we don't have, for example, the right technology. So yes, we do need technology and know-how to be competitive in quality, quality, first of all, and then, of course, come also the quantity. Okay? Now, next thing that we ask is, how come that African agriculture lagging behind the West? And this is in light of investments. So many tens of billions, if not hundreds of billions of dollars invested into African agriculture in different investment models. The problem is when you go and you meet the farmers, when you visit the, the villages, what you see is failures. And this is why poverty prevail and it's all over. It is a catastrophe. And it is maybe time to stop and to ask, is it really time to, to do more of the same or should we do something different? I want to suggest something different, very radical. And to take us now to see a different business model, and that is one 
that uh, Korea used. And Korea in the 20th centuries, in the 40s and the 50s, was a very, very poor country, like many of the African countries. And they had a good big steel industry, but not much of added value generated. And so they thought, what can we do? In the mid 60s, they said, you know what? And uh, together with the industry, they approached technological companies, investors in the premium markets. For example, the United States, Europe, Japan, and said, look, we are a very, very cheap place for you, low cost place for you to produce. Now let's make an agreement. You give us your technology and know-how for no charge because we cannot pay for it. We will produce whatever you want, okay? And in return, you will get, for example, cars or engines and other things. And you will get it for a good price, good for you. So you can sell it later in your own premium markets for a nice profit. This way you can also finance your technology, your know-how, protocols, whatever. And of course, you can generate income to us. So this way, of course, so many technologies and know-how transferred to Korea and look at Korea today. By the way, the same protocol, the same model also generated the huge superpower China. They did not have the technology and the know-how like 40 years ago. But you know, today it is different. So this is uh, a game changer model. And just note the investor on the right side that yes, the government step in and the private sector, they need to be in. Now, how is it today in Africa? In fact, in Africa today, you have the premium markets, just like we saw before. You have the production line, which is the field or the orchard. And of course, you have the local market. By the way, I didn't mention, but also Korea and China, everybody has got their own local markets. But anyone who tried to do it only with its own local market failed. So how it works? Now, the same good companies, let's say irrigation, they come to the farmer and they say, look, we have technology, we have know, but you need to pay, of course. And the farmers, okay, you need to pay. And the farmer is saying to himself, okay, I, I know that it is good technology and know-how, but let's see, I'm still losing 50 to 80% of my produce. I have low yield, I cannot export, I need to sell most or all of my produce to the local market, which generate pennies instead of dollars. And so how can I do it? How can I bridge this difference? Do you see the problem of the farmer? He has no way ever to bridge that gap, even if we give him funds, loans from the banks and so on. Um, and this is why it is not changing. Doesn't matter the World Bank, NGOs, whoever. This is a gap that has no solution today. Um, another problem is for the companies and the investors in the premium markets. Because today getting dollars, euros out of Africa is not easy. It's very expensive, sometimes impossible. So this is a model that simply, as we know, doesn't work. And the results that we see of the huge poverty is exactly the reflection of this model. So business model that is made to energize continuous growth, we simply don't have it. So, we're talking about attitude of prosperity, science, 
to build our own technology and know-how and framework of a new business model. This is what we need to move from agriculture to agro industry. So how do we do it? How do we move from theory to real world practice? This is the, the big question. And I will share with you now what my team uh, and myself are doing. First of all, Green Valley is all about this, this transition from agriculture to agro-industry. And the first thing that we do is we said, we focus on export and we want to export the best possible. We start with the crop that is the largest, has a, today a potential just in Europe of hundreds of millions a year. And from different reasons, including chemical residues, biosecurity, low taste uh, quality, it is not being exported. So we say this is our model, which is not only a model, it's a great uh, business. And what we want, we don't want those mangoes to be harvested too early green because nobody likes it. And we know it from our uh, survey. Also too late when it is infested, it's not good because we, then we have biosecurity issues. So we need it to be uh, harvested late enough, very tasty, but no biosecurity issues and no chemical residues. And this is exactly what we are doing. By the way, label with Green Valley. So the first thing that we say about prosperity is also part of our vision. And we start with the farmer. The farmer should have improved livelihood. And there is no limits to improve livelihood, unlike poverty that is very limited. Anything about $1.9 a day. The second thing, after we said about this is the attitude, now we're talking about technology and science. And uh, when I founded Biofeed, I said, okay, we know today we have sprays, all kinds of sprays, and they are poisonous because of this hard to export, effectiveness, you know, not so good as we just saw it. And by the way, Africa suffer from mosquitoes, that also, you know, none of the, of the uh, technologies is really effective, endless other pests. Uh, when we think of traps, even less effective and also not good for export because of biosecurity and so on. And when we think of genetic modified insects or crops, nobody likes it or many people, especially in Europe, so it's also a problem and it's not effective. So what we really wanted is something new, something there that doesn't exist, highly effective, no chemical residues, no infestation, easy to export, easy to implement. And uh, yes, Israel, we used it as our laboratory. No? And um, now for 21 years, Israeli farmers are using this technology without sprays. I will show you. And um, no chemical residues and they export. And then because we are talking about different insects, just a few years ago, we won a competition to develop for India, uh, which suffer heavily from fruit flies and losing, just like Africa, between 50 to 80% of its mangoes, and mango is the number one fruit crop also in India. Uh, we're talking about 9 million tons a year. And this is what we did. We developed for India a, a, a solution that is called Freedom. This is a technology to go together with protocol. And it was so successfully implemented that in one year, it reduced infestation from 80% to less than 1%, which is the standard for export. No sprays, no infestation, 
just like it is in Israel. Just a month after, because it, it was so successful, I was invited to meet uh, the Prime Minister of India and the Prime Minister of Israel in Tel Aviv in the first time they were meeting. A few months after, I met them again in India. And here I present, this is just in a few words, it is based on um, attracting to smell. It's all about smells, but it is a novel breaking through technology like nothing else. Okay, so now the model, the business model, we are back, just one second, yeah. We are back um, to the business model because we do have a solution to the technology and the know-how. So the third thing that we had to deal with is model. Again, we see here the Korean model, let's call it this way. And now let's see how we design the new uh, um, model that is uh, disruptive. First of all, we need to control the, the value chain. If we cannot control the quality of the value chain, we cannot promise the consumer in Europe, in America, in Japan, in China, the quality that you will get. So first of all, this is one thing. And more than this, now we're saying, yes, part of it is we uh, saying this is made in Africa. This is tastier. And this is no sprays. It will say the name of the country in Africa. And more than this, later, which is hopefully next year, people who will buy this mango can also see through a QR exactly where uh, it was produced, the name of the village, and maybe even the name and the faces of the farmers. So this is how far we are going with it. We want to connect the consumers back to the roots, back to the farmers. It's all about this. It's not about us. Now, the business model that is generated from this is disruptive for the agro industry. And what we are saying is it's based on premium markets. We need to bring technology, know-how, protocol to the farmer free of charge, free of charge. And look on the right side, you see there are investors, which can be any one of you and I invite you. Those investors are, not, are private investors, also governmental, also global, everybody should take part in this uh, endeavor. So what I show you for free, we practically do it now. We practically do it and this is how it works. We give it to the farmers, not to the investors. In return, we do not ask for money because we know it is too expensive. And if we would, they simply wouldn't be able to pay. We're talking about thousands of euros per hectare. It is impossible for them to pay. If they income, their income today is between a few hundreds and sometimes just a little bit more than a thousand. So we ask for the, for the mangoes and that is possible. And then as I showed before in the value chain, we, we harvest the mangoes, we pack it, we ship it to premium markets, we, where we have agreements with importers and we sell it for premium price. Now, hopefully we have, just like in the cars before, a big enough uh, gap between the cost and the price that we can generate and finance it exactly the way it is in other industries. And the same thing is not only for fruit flies, of course. You can do it with anything you have in mind. In the case of fruit flies and mangoes, it is because this is a go, no go. No investor in the world that got any sense in his mind will, will invest in a 
factory that is losing between 50 to 80% of his income. And in practice, because they cannot export, in practice, we, we are talking about between 90 to 99%. If you remember before I showed you 50,000 euros Israelis and Africans practically losing, we are talking about 99%. This is the real world. This is not fake numbers. So business model, now we see the gap. And this is this gap is a multi-billion dollars, euros gap, starting with mangoes and the sky is the limit, maybe not even the sky. Uh, this is a good gap, it's good for the farmer because he has a way to grow. Israeli farmers do not have much to grow in their income today. They will have to struggle. But Africans, who, if we use this model, they can double and triple and we did it. We did it. We helped African farmers in the past uh, years to double and triple in one year, the income. And again, today, based on this novel model, very, very new, uh, they don't need to pay. They pay nothing, they only get money. They only need through agreements to agree that this fruit belongs to Green Valley. Very simple, okay? And we need partners. So Green Valley is about winner's attitude. It's about breakthrough science for Africa, for African farmers and the agro industry and a disruptive business model. This is a vehicle to transfer Africa's economy from agriculture to agro industry that no matter what we do, this is the way it will go. You, we, no one can avoid it if you want prosperity. And if this resonance in your dreams, in your passion, in your, what you want to do for hundreds of millions of people. Um, you're very welcome to join me, to join Green Valley team and uh, take part in this wonderful journey. Thank you very much. Wow, wow, wow. Thank you so much, Dr. Nimrod. Um, do you prefer Dr. Nimrod or Professor Nimrod? Doctor. Doctor. Okay. Um, if you exit, let's see your face. If you exit the PowerPoint, there are a couple of questions mm. coming in for you, sir. Yeah, Fantastic. Yeah. So let's get right into it. Um, if you have questions, please keep dropping it. Um, Abbasade Ogundimu says, Dr. Israeli, thank you for your discussion on agriculture. My family has a plantation of plantain, cocoa, and cola. I am planning on going back home to dive into this field. What would you advise for a startup farming in Nigeria to be specific? Any advice? <laughs> there, there are, yes, we discussed now, and the reason we decided to start with mangoes is because we see the greatest potential for African uh, farmers and investors wherever they come from. Um, if you think of plantain, how much money you can make per hectare? Let's say that you have the best yield and the best price, probably you will get to a few hundred euros per hectare, maybe one or 2,000, that's it. But as you can see with mangoes, we're talking about one, 100 times more, mm. okay? So we want to aim to where already many farmers are there and where prosperity can grow. If you are talking with thinking about rice and you need to compete with the Americans, how can you compete? Okay, but the Americans cannot compete with mangoes of Africa. This is the blue ocean. And we are looking for blue oceans. We do not want to get in red oceans that even if you get the best results, you will still 
remain in poverty mm. or, or poor. Um, it's, it doesn't mean that in the future, we cannot get into it. Of course we can, of course we will. But let's start with something, as I said, you know, my big dream is about Africa becoming um, the, uh, the, the, the place where generate um, the food for the rest of the world, uh, the bun, the food bun of the world. This is what I dream about. I think it's possible in our lifetime. As I said, 20 years, yes, it is. We can see it. Um, our children can grow into this world. China is now a power, superpower. It wasn't when we were kids. It wasn't. Why can't we do it in Africa? With food, not with industry, not with making gadgets. Let's compete where we can and let's make it great and let's make a, an example. An example, you should start with one thing, not with 10 things, make it perfect. And when we think of um, disruptive, it's not disruptive technology, although we have great technology that no one in the world can compete. Disruptive is about disruptive business model. And if now we can give to farmers, you know, like in the past, we had the, 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 the big frame computers that a, a country could have maybe one or two, a country. Now everybody's got a cell phone, everybody, maybe even two or three, which is better than this super computer. Mm. The price, the price and the effectiveness, everything is down. Now what we're saying is, look, we can get to the poorest farmers in the world, give them something for free, as long as we know how to sell it in export markets for a added value. Hmm. Is there something that the price is lower than free? And while doing it, we generate the education, the know-how, um, how to use it, the, the marketing way of thinking, because farmers are business people. They are not idiots, they are business people, but only they are not giving the right business model. And it's not about them. We are to blame, we, including myself. Okay, it took me a long time to discover this. And, I, and it happened the, the hard way, trust me. So let's start <laughs> with one. And I say to anyone who really interested in changing the world and the lives of hundreds of million people. By the way, Africa, I see, I think that it can be a model also to about 700 or some 700 million farmers in India. And look at China. China is so advanced, but not its technology. So China is going to Africa and it wants to have its own farms in Africa because its own agro industry is so poor managed. So poor managed. China can grow its own food in China if farmers will get the right business model. It will not go to Africa. African will export many, many things to all over the world. Don't worry. Hmm. Wow. Okay. One, one thing that keeps coming up, Dr. Nimrod, is business model. I think we need to, and, and that's why I'm, I, I, teach, I teach business development and all of these things, because at the end of the day, when we say trade with Africa, it's not about sentiments. <laughs> a lot of times people come at it with, oh, I care, I care. No, you have to look at the numbers. You have to do your research and which is what you're demonstrating. Yes, you can apply this, this technology to plantain, but guess what? If you applied it to mango, you generate more, right? So I think at the end of the day, that's something we've, I, I want people to walk away with. 
is the idea of research, number, investment mindset in agriculture versus, okay, it's already cocoa. We need to do the same thing that has already been done. So can, can you share a little bit more, you know, when you say business model, when you say research, just help people understand why, how important that is. Yes. So when I founded Biofeed, it was after a long time in the academy. And I said, I want to do something good for the world. And I think that maybe I can do it better uh, in industry, in research, uh, than being a farmer myself and going back to my farm. So I didn't go back to my farm. And uh, I founded Biofeed. I didn't know what we're going to do. Hmm. I just knew one thing. Whatever we have today is not good. I, I share it with you. Sprays, I know sprays, I use them. In Israel, I'm considered an expert in spraying, just so you know. This is how I started. I, I reset the boundaries of sprays myself. I have thousands of hours spraying myself as a farmer, going with the tractor in the fields. And um, I said, no, Biofit, we are not going to do sprays or a better spray or organic spray. We don't want sprays. And traps, traps are not good. So anything I was looking at, no matter what the price, I didn't say the price, by the way, to myself or, my, or to my team, just say what we want, what is our dream. And our dream was something that I was dreaming as a farmer. Help me something very simple. I just put it in the field. It is working and working for a long time. So I don't need to recharge it or replace it or service. It is not poisonous for me, not for the environment, not for the consumers. And you know what? I would love it to be as good as sprays. Is that too much to ask? Mm. And today, uh, this technology, which is called freedom, actually, uh, as I showed you in Africa and Asia and all over the world, um, the results with, with sprays, with the use of uh, sanitation, with the use of traps, with the use of sterile insect technique, with everything that is cost enormous amounts, is between 50 to 80% fruit damage. And when we work, it is practically zero. Oh. So export is possible, including the rainy season. Today, the season of harvest and export or marketing of mangoes is limited only before the uh, rainy season. Not because there are no problems before, because before the infestation is bef between 30 to 50% damage and after, it is going up from 50% to 100%. So how much it worth if you now can have a season with another two or three months, which means practically doubling the season of fruiting and harvest. How much it worth when you can harvest the fruit really on time, like it is done where I'm used to in Israel. You don't ask when the fruit fly is coming, to ask when the market is ready, when the price is better and best. Mm. So this is what the, the kind of, of thinking that we have today with the technology that we are having. Um, we, by the way, I didn't say anything about it, but after India, we went to Africa. That was 2018. We developed an hour expense a product that is good for the three species of fruit flies in, uh, in Africa that attack mangoes. Just the development is, the cost is enormous. Uh, you can ask the agrochemical companies how much it is to develop something. And uh, this is something that we did. Then we started working results wherever we went uh, is the same, no infestation, whether it is small holders, really small or big. Uh, no. <laughs> so 
this is this is what what it is. Okay, this is sorry. <laughs> You're fine. This is what it is, and uh, now we are finally after we are uh, through so many uh, issues, including clarifying our own business model. Uh, we started marketing, and uh, it's a great pleasure. Yes. To do it. Yeah. Yes. So we have some comments. It says, uh, great presentation, Dr. Israeli. And someone said, hmm, thank you so much. Mango will be my first focus then. <laughs> um, um, one says, great presentation, Dr. Nimrod. Um, and then there's a question or a comment. Let me read it out here. Um, Dr. Israeli, disruptors are typical over, um, overshadowed by established practices and institutions. Who do you want to allow, okay, well, who do not want to allow the farmers to benefit? So who might you need to partner with via the government leaders to enforce this breakthrough? So the way I understand it is, well, if you're bringing a new technology into the market, you're seeing, um, you, you know, they want to push you out. So how do you effectively implement this type of solution? Do you need to partner with the government or how do you just strategically go about this? This is one of the things that uh, um, if, you, if you know Clayton Christensen talking about disruptive innovation, mm -hmm. uh, you know that we are not competing. We are not competing uh, the current companies. We are not. We started by trying to compete them, but today not. Um, our partners are not the agrochemical companies. We are giving it for free. Our partners are now the importers in Europe, the exporters in Africa, the farmers, maybe also the governments that is up to them. So we are going around the problems. Mm. And uh, right now we have great difficulties because the custom, for example, doesn't believe us that we are giving it for free. So they charge it for it. For it. So this is one of the difficulties. Uh, but since the condition is so terrible, uh, we find that it is easier to, to enter. There is a great hunger also in Europe. They want, they want, trust me, they want to work with Africa. They want to import from Africa. Americans would love to, because today in America, when you buy a mango from, from Mexico, Brazil, you don't know, but before this mango, because of fruit flies, is being cooked. They put it in hot water for one hour, and this is what you get. It's not the same taste. And also, still, they do have other uh, fruit flies, uh, so they still need to buy it, to uh, harvest it earlier than they should. So even the, the good taste of mango is affected by it. And yes, from Africa, we can export also to America. If we only have the right protocols, technology, know-how, and the value chain is working with us as it does today. Okay. Wow. So everybody is there. Yes, they are not aligned. They're still not sure. And they are looking and just remember, you know, try to remember China, Korea, other industries that today are so successful. It wasn't easy for none. There needs to be trust and, uh, and vision. And uh, this is what, what we bring. But today we don't bring just the dream, we practically bring technology, know-how, and this the same concept of technology can be used for endless other kind of insects, crops, um, and, uh, and even um, continent. So, and by the way, I mentioned before, Mosquitoes that are killing 500,000 kids every year in Africa. This is such a failure of everybody. Such a failure. 
So no, we should say at a certain point, more of the same, maybe it's not enough. Maybe mm. we shouldn't continue. Wow. That's and this is what we say. Yeah. yeah, that's a powerful statement. Um, John here is saying, Dr. Nim, um, Dr. Israeli, great talk today. Thank you for helping feed the world. Um, um, Joanne says Africa is growing what it sell best already. Um, collaboration is key to actually sell it to the premium market and increase farmers' income. How do you see that collaboration with um, Green Valley? Um, I think yes. that was the, the last question. Um, how do people po possibly um, collaborate with you? or you know a partner or support like or do you provide services or consulting right so we we are very active so first of all you have my email you have my uh, whatsapp contact me this is yeah. the starting point simply contact because each each one each investor each farmer each importer um, government official has different issues and first of all i want to understand what you want Mm -hmm. This is how I will start, not by telling you what I want, by asking you, and then see how we can fit in and maybe even design for you the right model for investment. Now, what we do today, um, because I manage Biofeed, we have a very good deal with Biofeed. So I managed to get the technology and the know-how and get it to the farmers free of charge, which means that I, Green Valley, later needs to pay biofeed, but not immediately, okay? So we give it to the farmers. Um, there are packing houses, there are exporters, there are investors in those countries in Africa uh, where we already work or, and where we can work and will work. Uh, Investors such as you in America, in the diaspora, wherever you are, all you need to change the world is to say, we leave the farmers to make their own dreams. But our part is to help the farmer to increase his income, mm. not by 100%. No, mm. that will take, like the farmers I've met in the, in the past couple of weeks, their income is about $1.9 a day, okay, per year. So no, this is not. We need to say our aim is, you know, the starting point is five, 10 times more. This, this is the starting point. And then we can grow on. And this, uh, this model is starting by focusing on quality, but later also yield because those farmers, because no one is ready to invest in them, their yield is between two tons to maybe, maybe 10 tons uh, uh, per hectare. While the normal one is 40 to 60 tons in Israel. Wow. How can you compare it? Wow. So we bring a full package and this is Green Valley. It's really, it's not just biofeed. Later, we want many more companies to come and enjoy the same model. We can generate money from those farmers. If some of them have higher yield, higher quality, they can move faster. If lower, they can move slower, but everybody can move forward. And it will be like any industry It's Korea. And uh, this is all possible. Wow, all wow. Possible. Wow. And, and I think for me, um, it's an honor to help make some introduction for you at the continental level, because that's why this, this content and your presentation will definitely be passed on to um, the African Union. There's a lot of work, as you know, going on in agriculture space. And I think this should be one of the portfolio of, um, you know, best practices, you know, that they should be considering right, as they are looking to invest, um, be it, um, Af um, you know, African Development Bank or Afri Afri Exim Bank or, or African Union. You know. um, so for me, I think that's that's just one thing I'm, I'm happy to do to feature the story and just to pass it on, you know, to the right quarters for sure. So definitely, I look forward to, to supporting you um, in, in that way, <laughs> right, just to 
I mean, make this one of the considerations for decision makers to take a look at. That's just the least we can do. Fine. Yes. I'm Sorry. just asking myself, since there is so much silence, is it so stupid what I was just saying? No, <laughs> it's so <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> it's so brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, okay, let me share. For me, one thing, you, you being laser focused on the farmers. A lot of times business models is all about, you know, what can we extract out of the value chain, right? But for me, you being so, being a farmer yourself, I think that's the first game changer right there, where your heart is with the farmers. That's one. The second thing that is so critical, and you use some words from Dil Christensen, the late, you know, in terms of how do we shift from <laughs> alleviating poverty to actually creating prosperity in Africa, which is the whole point of trade with Africa is that everybody talks about um, war, famine, disease, all of those things, but people don't talk about economic development within the context of wealth creation, right? Which is why you and I both align. The moment you start talking about wealth creation and move away from poverty alleviation, that's really when you start moving towards wealth creation. So I think everything you said, I, I'm sure it will take people a while to digest it, but those are key callers. Those are fundamental shifts in mindset that has to be applied within the agriculture. And not just agriculture, I think across board. Wealth creation, economic development, and also understanding what it takes at the grassroots level. So yeah, your, your PowerPoint for sure, your presentation. I mean, speaking for myself, I can't speak for other people. Um, I think it's absolutely brilliant novel and should be the way we need leaders to think going into the future. That's that's my so, thoughts. Thank you very much. I just shared on the on the question a link where you can also, in addition, uh, register once a week. I send uh, an newsletter. article. Mm -hmm. Yes, a newsletter uh, which is dealing exactly in uh, business models, in uh, economy, in agriculture, technology, farmers. And um, uh, you are very welcome to join it. You will get it to your mail. Um, and wow. of course, you got my contact. So Yes, fantastic. Fantastic. And for me, this platform is a growing platform. And it's not one of those. And I hope people realize that this is not... This is not a platform you jump in, you jump on and you jump out off. <laughs> you, you don't do that because we're growing together. And that's why even we have people that have been with us for four years, because every year we get to all come together again, share best practices, what has happened, what's, what are the um, um, success stories we've, we've encountered, what has grown. So this, this is a continuation. Right, this platform is a continuation, and I invite you, Dr. Nimrod. We want to follow your story. We want to be a part of a, a win of your story, and we welcome you, you know, on this platform to come back, share with us progress made, because we're really just at the beginning of this transformation um, when it comes to um, trade with Africa across sectors, across sectors. So thank you so much, and you know, you're now you're now one of us, and please stay connected, um, and please, um, you know. People need to just plug in and watch this um, revolutionary um, transformation in the agriculture space. Thank you, sir. Such an honor. Look, the, the simple reason that my skin color is not black, <laughs> I'm black inside. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and I I'm wish I'm already I... one of you. <laughs> oh, thank you, sir. Thank you, thank sir. Thank you. Uh, much blessings. So um, thank you, everyone. I, I'm sure you're having a great time. You, you know, if you were meeting in person, this would be a good time to take a break. But we really want to run through um, the next um, couple of presentations. But here's the thing. Our next presenter is not able to join us because of health issues. So we are going to bring um, Mr. Sh uh, Sean on um, as the next presenter. But um, Mr. Mata Matiza, um, that was supposed to join us from South Africa, actually, um, you know, is in our prayers. It's, 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 there's some health issues, but um, he was supposed to cover infrastructure development for us because it's one of those few 
um, um, certified instructors on the continent that actually teaches people how to structure deals. So public private sector deals. So I, I did share with him that we would need to bring him back probably in one of our monthly sessions um, as an instructor to guide people because at the end of the day, um, when you want to go in with Trade with Africa, you need to be skilled in deals and PPPs and what th those things need to look like. And it does work for the government at one of the economic zones um, in South Africa. So I apologize that um, we, you know, we, we won't be able to cover the infrastructure development segment, but 